Good afternoon, everybody. Jeff, uh, Jeff promised 12.45, and uh, 12.45 it is. So we're going to move forward with the program this afternoon. Again, we're very happy that you're here with us today. My name is Joel Halcom. I'm one of the uh, church volunteers uh, that's been involved with the, uh, with the event today. And we thank you for being here. I'm uh, just going to introduce our, our, our second speaker, Dr. Keith Miller, uh, who comes to us by way of the great state of Kansas. He is from the, the Little Apple, uh, Manhattan, Kansas, where uh, Kansas State University is located. Uh, and he holds a post in the, as a professor in the Department of Geology there. Uh, Keith is not originally from the Midwest, though. He is uh, from the eastern part of the country. He grew up in southeastern part of Pennsylvania. And uh, for those of you, like uh, my wife and daughter, who read Beverly Lewis novels, you know that that's uh, Amish country and a, lot, and a heavy concentration of, uh, of Mennonite denomination. Uh, he grew up in a strong Christian home. His parents taught Sunday school for many years. Uh, Keith uh, showed aptitude and affinity for scientific things from a young age. He told me that he was always collecting rocks and fossils and leaves and other tidbits. So God bless his parents for all the things that he likely dragged into the house. Uh, he decided to uh, uh, pursue, originally intending to be an earth science teacher uh, for middle school students. He uh, pursued a degree at Franklin and Marshall College uh, in the Pennsylvania area. Uh, where they have a very strong program in geology. Uh, eventually, changed tack a little bit, uh, decided that he uh, really liked field geology so much that it would be better suited for him to, uh, to teach and work in a university setting. So he went on to receive a master's degree and then eventually a, a doctorate degree in geology, uh, his doctorate coming from University of Rochester, which is New York, not Minnesota. Uh, while he was at University of Rochester, he met his wife, Ruth, uh, through InterVarsity Fellowship, where they both have been very active in that Christian fellowship uh, for many years. Uh, they have one son who's currently at Lafayette College, uh, out, again, about, out, out in the eastern part of the country, uh, pursuing, uh, I think he's a double major in physics and, and engineering. So a lot of brain power in the family, uh, and God bless that kid. He's not, not afraid to take on a challenge. Um, Keith has been at, uh, at, at Kansas State for, since 1990 uh, and has been uh, working there in his discipline. He has uh, uh, actively published and been involved in research. Uh, he's actually, uh, because of his Christian faith and his expertise in geology, he has often in the past been called to talk about faith and science and how those two disciplines interact. And so he's uh, read and talked and, and about these types of issues and thought about them uh, for most of his uh, adult life. So I think you'll enjoy his presentation today. Uh, so Dr. Keith Miller. Love technology. <laughs> Can you hear me now? A little bit. Well, uh, oh, yes, OK. <clears throat> um, very much appreciate the invitation to be here. Um, and uh, I really appreciate um, the efforts of the organizers in putting this together. I think it's a very valuable opportunity. Uh, I think it's something that um, the, the church really needs to, to take on. There's a lot of issues here that um, deserve some, some serious discussion uh, within the, the Christian community. I'd like to start out uh, by <clears throat> very emphatically stating that um, my work as a geologist is not, I'm not a Christian who happens to be a geologist. I'm a geologist because I'm a Christian. Uh, it is my spiritual Christian vocation. And I think it's critical that we kind of dispense with the kind of secular, uh, um, sacred distinction in our lives, where we compartmentalize our lives into different pieces 
and we have a religious life or a church life and we have a professional life or a working life. It shouldn't be that way. Um, that we are a whole people and uh, our ministry is a holistic one and that whatever you choose as your, your, your role, your work, your profession, your personal ministry is your vocation, whatever that is. Um, and I definitely view what I do as a scientist, whether I'm doing my science, whether I'm teaching, whether I'm in a public venue, uh, all of that I understand and comprehend as part of my specific Christian vocation. Um, and that is really uh, a subset of the point that I'm really trying to communicate this afternoon, uh, which is that the whole uh, very popular, very widely viewed tension or conflict or warfare between science and faith is completely false. It's historically false. It's a myth. Um, and that one thing I'm going to try to do here is very quickly, very briefly, uh, run through the history of early geology and try to make the point that geology as well as all the sciences developed within a Christian context or a theistic context. Um, and that um, you know, rather than uh, science and faith being in this kind of perpetual historical conflict in which you have the you know, progressive advance of, of scientific understanding at the expense of faith, expense of, of uh, theology, uh, that they're really complementary ways of, of understanding uh, the reality of the universe. Um, and I think that um, John Walton is, has made that point from his vantage point as, as a biblical scholar. I'm going to try to make the same point from the vantage point of a practicing scientist. Uh, so, far from opposing science, as I said, their Christian theology and the, the historical development of the sciences um, went in, in harmony with each other. Uh, and uh, sciences, in particular, geology and paleontology, which is what I'm going to focus on, uh, largely developed, uh, was largely developed in a the theistic worldview and by devout Christians. Um, so, I could give you a brief uh, historical kind of cliff notes um, of the early history of geology. And it's fascinating um, because it, all, it very much focuses on fossils, which is my area of interest. I'm a paleontologist. Um, and discovering Earth history was a consequence of trying to understand the nature of fossils. Um, and originally, the word fossil, this is uh, back in uh, the 1500s and before that, the word fossil literally means something dug up. Anything out of the ground is a fossil, right? Um, and so, clearly, there's a wide variety of fossil objects, things that today we would recognize by the definition of or term fossils. But anything out of the ground is a fossil. Archaeological artifacts, minerals, gemstones, they're all fossils, because they all come out of the ground. Uh, so the question for the people at this time was not uh, whether fossils represent the existence of once living things or not, but which ones do and how do we tell. Um, and they had, you know, it's kind of, uh, John Walton was, was emphasizing, we have to put our place ourselves in those historical contexts, in those historical and cultural contexts to understand what was going on. If we try to understand what was happening in the 1500s or 1600s or 1700s, from our modern perspective, we'll get it all wrong, okay? And so, I want to start in the 1500s. And in the 1500s, there's very much a, a sense of um, magical connections. I think magic is about the best way to, to ex uh, express it these hidden magical connections that kind of united all the objects in the universe. So that there were connections between astronomical bodies and human history, right? So you had the, the 
and the motions of the stars or constellations or planets impacting the course of human history. Um, you had connections between celestial objects and, and earthly objects, between living and non-living, um, between animals and plants, all these kind of magical networks that connected things. Um, and in addition, not only did they accept the idea of spontaneous generation for living things, but they also had no reason to reject the idea of spontaneous uh, generation for the fossils themselves. They could grow, a fossil fish could grow in, uh, within the rock, and that was, there was no philosophical or um, objection to that possibility. So to kind of give you a sense of that, this is the, one of the very first uh, compendiums or encyclopedias of fossil objects um, by a guy named Conrad Gessner in 1565. And this is the frontispiece of the cover sheet for that encyclopedia. And you can see the word fossi there. It's all written in Latin. Um, so this is a book of fossil objects. This is the front page. What's on the front page? Those don't look like fossils. Yeah, those are gemstones. And they're not just gemstones, they're birthstones. Okay? Those are gemstones that are connected to the zodiac, which gave those particular gemstones particular magical, mystical powers. There's also a signet ring with a scarab on it. Scarab had a lot of kind of particularly Egyptian kind of mysticism associated. So these are particularly interesting and important fossil objects, because they had these special magical properties. That's why they're on the cover. This is another page. This looks more like what we would expect in an encyclopedia of fossils. So the fossil objects at the bottom, but interestingly enough, at the top are drawings of living um, animals, um, sea urchins in this case, and making the comparison and similarity between those living things and those fossil objects. But that, sim that similarity in appearance didn't necessarily imply to the people at the time that they were related as far as their origin. That, that didn't necessarily mean that those fossil objects were the remains of once living organisms. They shared a magical connection, affinity, but there's no reason why those fossils didn't grow in the rocks completely independently of living things. <clears throat> so, there's all these problems that faced someone who was trying to understand the origin of these very interesting objects that people were gathering out of the ground. And these are some of them. Um, why are there some fossils that look kind of organic? <clears throat> they look like they might have been living, but there's nothing living today that looks like these. Okay, these are very strange things. We don't know anything around us that looks like this. So that's called the problem of form. Why do these things look so weird, so different? Uh, some of them are made up of mineral compositions that they knew living organisms don't make. So how'd that happen? And biggest problem of all, how did they get in the rocks? How do those fossil objects get in the rocks? And here are just some illustrations of those kind of visual representations of those problems. Here's a problem of form. Okay, these are extinct uh, groups of fossils for which there is no modern uh, relative or nothing that looks like them today. And so, looking at this, they didn't see anything around them that looked like this. So there was no necessary reason to see them as having uh, been once living. Problem of composition uh, and the preservation of, of fossils. Um, very often, there's mineralogical changes that occur. The shells are replaced by other minerals. There's chemical changes occur. Um, so that you get things, for example, the, the fossils on the right that are now composed of uh, iron pyrite or, or fool's gold, or they're composed of silica. Okay? Those weren't the original compositions. And of course, how did the fossils get in the rocks? Well, this leads us to a really cool story. A guy named Nicholas Steno uh, from the 1600s. And one of the things that um, 
is important to realize about this time is that the, those who were educated, the, the educated people of the time, were um, theologians, they were part, they were theologians, pastors, or physicians, basically. Those are the, the kind of two professions uh, that you would enter into if, if you were an educated person. Uh, and oftentimes they're the same thing. You know, your local pastor was also the community physician. Um, uh, Nicholas Steno uh, went on to become a Catholic bishop uh, and involved in uh, evangelism for the faith. He, he ultimately died, uh, and, uh, uh, lived a very aesthetic, aesthetic life, uh, had uh, health problems, and, and died fairly early in his life. Um, but he was also very involved in understanding the natural world. And much of his early work had to do with anatomy. He did some of the earliest work on understanding aspects of the human anatomy, doing dissections and things, um, and uh, publishing articles on, on human anatomy. And he would have been the local physician in his area where he lived in uh, Tuscany, Italy. But yet, he's kind of recognized as one of the founders of geology. And how that came to be is very, very interesting. So there he is, after he had become a bishop. And <laughs> of all things, it began with a shark's head. So the way this happened is, fisherman was out in the Mediterranean, caught this big shark, thought it was really interesting. Um, didn't have a way to save the whole thing, so he lopped off its head and came in to shore. And what do you do if you have a curiosity um, that you want to have explained? Well, you take it to the local authority, and the local authority is going to be uh, the head of the church or your, the local physician, who was Steno. So he brought the head to Steno. And Steno then dissected the shark's head. And um, what he found was he was really intrigued by the teeth and the jaws of this thing. And he said, the, the teeth in this shark look just like these fossils that are weathering out of the cliffs near the coast of Tuscany um, that are called tongue stones. And they had all kind of magical and mystical origins, uh, uh, you know, the, fo uh, the tongues of serpents and, and all kinds of, of weird things, things that fell down from heaven during thunderstorms, you know, all these kind of creative ways of understanding where these things came from. And he said, you know, these shark's teeth look like smaller examples of these tongue stones. Well, there's one of those, quote, tongue stones to the left. It's a lot bigger than a modern shark's teeth, right? So this is a, would have had to have been a really, really big shark. But otherwise, they're very, very similar. Well, he wasn't satisfied with that, just saying they looked alike. So he had to deal with those problems that we just talked about. Here's his drawing, his uh, illustration of that shark's head. It looks kind of fanciful to us, but this was kind of the standard you know, illustration techniques of the time. And below there, he illustrates the teeth. So in order to make this comparison between these shark's teeth and these tongue stones that people were finding, again, he had to be able to answer those questions. The one with form is fairly easy. It's just pretty much a matter of size, right? So the living shark's teeth look just like the tongue stones, except the tongue stones are just a lot bigger. But the other problem still remained. Uh, composition problems, and how did they get in the rock? Well, for the composition, he argued that uh, chemical compounds could penetrate into uh, those um, original teeth, and um, there could be chemical changes occur, volatilization, which means certain elements could be uh, removed by turning into gases, and, and you could have chemical reactions occurring to, to change the chemical composition of those teeth. Um, but he spent a lot of his time saying, how did they get in the rocks? 
And so I said, well, what if those rocks were originally deposited from water, and those rocks represent sediments, mud and sand, kind of raining out of the water? Uh, and then if you have sharks dying or shedding their teeth, they could fall to the bottom of that and get covered up with a sediment, and that could be then compacted and turned into rock. Um, and that's how, got, that's how the fossils could get inside the rock. And then there must have been something else happening in order to lift those fossil-bearing sediments up above sea level, where they were today. And what's really cool about Steno, and it really shows what, how, the, how scientific investigation works, is that make an observation, you draw a conclusion, and then you say, well, if that's true, then what's the implication of that, right? And you keep following it step by step, right? Keep following your implications and testing them as you go. And that's what he did. He didn't leave it there. He said, okay, well, <laughs> if, if these rocks were formed by sediments raining out of water, raining out of a fluid, what, what are some ways that that would behave? What, what would be the result of that, the consequence of that? And he came up with what are now considered the foundational principles of historical geology. And they're listed there, okay? Original horizontality, lateral continuity, and superposition. So I'm going to go through each one of these. What do these mean? Start with the last one there, superposition, okay? If you are creating sedimentary rocks by raining sediments out of the overlying water column, right? the sediments on the bottom had to be put there first. Right? And then each layer subsequently on top of that has to be progressively younger. So imagine, let's say, if I, if I um, gave you a, a jar, a glass jar, and had a whole lot of layers of colored sand in there, right? And I said, which layer did I put in the jar first? Everyone would say the one at the bottom, right? That's the reasonable conclusion if those sediments were deposited out of a water column in succession, the ones in the bottom have to be older. That's the idea of superposition. So that if we have a sequence of rocks, okay, a sequence of sedimentary rocks, that the ones in the bottom represent the first, earliest, and as you go up that stack, you get progressively younger. And that will be absolutely critical. The idea of lateral continuity. Okay, if you look at a landscape, there's Grand Canyon, right? You can look across that and you can trace the same rock layer across the canyon. Well, what he said is those rock layers wouldn't have just stopped. They weren't created that way, right? That, that canyon wasn't created like that with, with those rock layers just ending. Originally, those layers were continuous across that surface, which meant that that canyon had to be eroded through them. And so all those rocks in between where the person that took the picture is standing and on the other side of the canyon, all those rocks had to be removed because they originally were continuous. In other words, rock layers just don't stop and start. They make continuous, laterally continuous layers. Also, if you're depositing sediments out of the water column, gravity is going to cause those layers to form horizontally, or at least roughly horizontal, as they're raining out by the force of gravity. So the original orientation of those layers is going to be horizontal. Usually they're not. In Kansas they are mostly, but not, not usually. Um, so what that means then, right, if those rocks were originally deposited horizontally, something happened, right? They were deposited horizontally, then something ha had to happen to tilt them. There had to be a subsequent event. So by law of superposition, you'd start down at the lower left, and each one of those layers 
represents progressively moving through time, so you're going up the time events from left to right, depositing all that, those layers, and then all those layers had to be tilted as a separate event after all those other layers were first formed. Or if you find them folded up like that, they were originally deposited horizontal. Some other event had to happen in order to deform them. I hope what you're seeing here is the beginning of history. Before Steno, as far as people were concerned, there was no such thing as Earth history. There was no principles upon which it could be read or interpreted. None of these principles, someone had to think of them, and it was Steno that thought of them. So before Steno, there was no Earth history, because people had no tools to see it. It was invisible to them. But just these very simple, basic rules or principles that came from trying to figure out how shark's teeth got into the sediments eroding from the cliff resulted in these principles. The consequence of that is the rock record was now a timeline. Okay. Earth his, there was Earth history. He invented Earth history. Earth history now existed. There's a way to read it. There's a way to read what we call relative time. In other words, the order in which events occurred. This layer was deposited, this layer was deposited, these layers were folded up, then they were eroded off these layers. You get a sequence of events. Steno made that possible. And again, this was all done within his theological worldview. And so he saw history as being directional, as having a beginning, moving through history in a particular direction with a consummation. <clears throat> and so the, the history that could now be read from the rocks is a part of that history, part of the creative history. Okay, fast forward to the 1700s. <clears throat> By now, fossils are widely recognized as the remains of once living things. Steno had resol resolved that, that problem. <clears throat> and using Steno's principles, people were now actively trying to uh, work out the Earth history using those principles. And <clears throat> again, because the history that they had uh, to, by which to approach this question was human history. Um, and so, logically, uh, at first, <clears throat> they, they didn't see any discontinuity between Earth history and human history. They were the same thing. Uh, and therefore, there were efforts to try to understand, initially trying to understand, the, the um, geologic history in terms of things like uh, the global, uh, the uh, Noah's flood, global deluge. Um, and there were a number of unresolved questions, very uh, high on the list of which was the problem of extinction. Because now that they could more confidently look at the, the geologic record, fossil record, and say, these, are, <clears throat> these organisms were once living things. We still had the problem of form in that there were all these, these fossils that didn't exist uh, in their world. And for a while, the argument was, well, we don't know the whole world yet. There's lots of the world we don't know. And these organisms were probably living in other places that we just haven't visited, right? By the 1700s, that's kind of hard to say, right? Because now the Europeans have have gone out, they've seen most of the world. <clears throat> and so the idea that you had all these uh, completely unknown um, animals uh, and plants living somewhere in the world that just hadn't been discovered wasn't really viable anymore as an option. So the question is, what happened to them? Where did they go? And this is a theological problem, <clears throat> because at the time they were very much influenced by um, Greek philosophy, uh, a lot of their ideas of, of perfection uh, were drawn not from scripture but from Greek uh, philosophy. And one of the ideas uh, of, and 
applying the idea of perfection to, to God and God's creation was that creation would be as full and diverse as possible and that anything that God would create, if it's created perfectly, couldn't die, couldn't go extinct. So extinction to them was a violation of the perfection of God. Because if God made a creation and there are parts of this creation that no longer existed, that implied some error, some imperfection in the original creation. So this, this created theological uh, problems. Okay, another person uh, in the 1700s that's important, is a guy named James Hutton. Um, he was a Scottish philosopher, and uh, he added on to some of the principles that had been developed by Steno, kind of expanding those. I'll sh show us a few of those. And he developed, uh, worked out the concept called uniformitarianism, which is very widely misunderstood. Now, hopefully I can clarify some of that. Uh, and there is Hutton, portrait of Hutton from that time. Um, and some of the additional principles that Hutton um, discovered to, to add on to those um, suggested by Steno was uh, principle of cross-cutting relationships. Again, these are all very common sense once you hear them. So it's saying, okay, you can see that inclined layer that's actually originally a... Uh, uh, an igneous, it's called an intrusion. It's originally molten material that was squeezed up into the rocks and then solidified. But the important concept here is anything that cross cuts, cuts across another unit, has to be younger than the unit that it cuts across. Another way to say that is that that intrusion can't intrude something that isn't there. It has to, that, section of rocks has to exist before something can intrude it. Again, perfectly obvious. Similarly, if you have a fault, that fault has to happen after those rock layers are formed. You can't fault something that doesn't exist. You can't fold something that doesn't exist. Right? Very obvious. But what it does is it adds other criteria by which you can work out the relative history. Okay? And what Hutton uh, did was, was seeing these kind of relationships. He worked in Scotland, and seeing these kind of relationships in the rocks uh, that he was looking at, and he recognized what are called, now we call, or he uh, coined the term unconformities, which are erosion layers. Uh, and what he recognized is there's period of, periods of deposition where you deposit a uh, number of rock layers and they get deformed in some way, then they can get eroded, then you deposit another set of rock layers on top of those, those may be also subsequently um, eroded, and so that these, these surfaces, erosion surfaces, had to require a lot of time to happen. Um, so here is one of his early illustrations. Uh, and so what you see at the bottom are these rock layers that are tilted up almost vertically. Actually, they're very tightly folded so that the rock layers now look like they're standing on end. And then you see that kind of uh, rubbly layer in there. And that represents, you know, cobbles and, and gravel and stuff that was eroded from those lower layers and was actually a, a soil. Uh, an ancient fossil soil horizon. Uh, so this was a landscape at that time. Uh, and then on top of it are another set of marine rock layers. So what that means is, first you had to deposit all those rocks at the bottom, then you had to fold them or deform them so they're now standing up vertically. Then you had to erode the surface off flat, develop a land surface, then you had to subside that whole land surface, deposit another set of rocks on top of that, and then actually tilt that one. Okay? 
So what this implied to Hutton was, wow, that took a long time to happen. And this is actually near that location. I had the privilege a few years ago to be able to kind of walk through some of the areas that Hutton visited uh, during his researchers, researches. And this is a place called Sicker Point in Scotland. What you see at the bottom, it's a little hard to see in this image, is those vertically oriented rock layers. And then there's the erosion surface that eroded those off. And then you see another set of rock layers deposited on top that are also themselves slightly tilted. Here's that same unit in another location. So you can see the near vertical rocks at the bottom, then that surface where they're, they're cut off, and then new sediments deposited on top, and then the whole thing tilted. And it was these particular locations, these are the very places that Hutton visited where he went, wow, that took a long time. Uh, these are all over the world. I mean, these are uh, abundant features of the geologic record. There's the Grand Canyon. It's called the Grand, uh, uh, Great Unconformity at the base of the Grand Canyon. You see the inclined layers at the bottom, and then there's the erosion surface at the top, and then a series of more flat-lying rocks say, sitting on top of that. Um, so again, these uh, imply great spans of time in order to happen. Um, another thing that, as I said, that, that Hutton introduced is this idea of uniformitarianism. And this, again, is very commonly uh, misunderstood. It really had several components, uh, one of which is sometimes called actualism, uh, which means that you use your understanding of, of present processes, of how you observe the world working now, and you use that as a basis to go back and interpret the past. Okay, so commonly the phrase is, the present is the key to the past. Okay? So we have to understand how the world works now. We have to understand how geology works now, how deposition and erosion and deformation, and all those kinds of things happen now. And then we can go back in the past and use that insight in order to understand the past. Okay? And that is fundamental to geology. It's fundamental to any science when you're trying to reconstruct the past. Another aspect of uniformitarianism, as proposed by Hutton, was this idea of uniformity of rate, okay? which he went the further step to say, OK, not only can I use these processes that are acting today to interpret the past, but I'm going to assume that the rate at which those processes happened was uniform over time. Okay? That aspect of Hutton's views was rejected. That part of Hutton's views is not part of modern geology. Actualism is, but not uniformity of rate. There are certain things that are uniformities of rate, you know, chemical reactions and physical relationships and things, but geologic processes, we don't assume that there was a uniformity of rate. Okay, back on? Okay. So I just put these up just to show very quickly how we use actualism today. Right? So um, on um, the two top panels are images of modern sediments. So these are sedimentary features that are forming today. We know how they're forming. We, know, we can watch them happen. We can model them. Um, in the lab, we can reproduce them. Uh, we know how they're formed in the modern environment. And we go into the geologic record and see the identical features. Okay? So, for example, on the left side are sediments that were deposited by a flowing river, a meandering river system. Well, we see the precise features, what we call sedimentary structures, in the geologic record, and then we can conclude that these were formed in the same kind of environment. We could even make conclusions as far as how fast the water was flowing and how deep it was and things like that because the, the nature of those structures varies with water velocities. Okay? On the right side are sand dunes. Okay? So at the top is a cross-section of a modern sand dune. 
has certain characteristic features that distinguish it from other types of depositional environments. We can go into the geologic record and find the precisely the same features. Again, we see those precise same features, and we therefore imply that they were formed in a similar, pro similar way, by a similar process. That's actualism. Same thing, um, same, the top two are modern environments, the bottom two are fossil, or from the geologic record. Uh, mud cracks on the left with footprints. Um, same thing uh, down in the lower left. Uh, rippled uh, sand layers uh, uh, on a coastline. Uh, again, the same thing, same identical kind of ripples from uh, the geologic record. So, again, that's how actualism works. Um, so, Hutton provided those kinds of additional uh, tools, a part of our toolkit to unlock the past. And made this very famous um, statement, no vestige of a beginning, no prospect of an end when looking at Earth history. And what he's not saying is that he thought the universe was eternal, or the physical universe was eternal. He did not believe that. That isn't what he meant. What he meant was, I can't see it. Earth history is so vast, so much has happened, that I can't see f that far back. It's lost. You know, you keep going back, it's kind of like tracing your family tree. You know, you reach a point where you just don't have, you just lose it, right? I can't go back any farther. So, he, he just thought, you know, the, the beginning is too far back. I can't see it. it, it. And similarly, I don't know where it's going. I don't know what the future holds. Um, this leads us into uh, another extremely important person in the history of geology and um, paleontology named uh, Cuvier, Georges Cuvier. Uh, he was a French anatomist, lived in an incredibly interesting time. If you look at those dates, you realize an awful lot happened during his lifetime, and he was French. Uh, so we have things like uh, you know, the French Revolution, and the Reign of Terror, and Napoleon, and the reestablishment of the monarchy, and you know, all that happened during his lifetime. And he didn't lose his head during the entire time, amazingly. Um, he was probably the, the greatest um, anatomist uh, of the time, and sometimes considered the greatest anatomist that ever lived. <clears throat> um, he had access to the world's uh, museums, as Napoleon was going out conquering the world, he sent all the stuff back to the museums of France, and Cuvier was in charge. Um, and he developed the <coughs> modern sciences of functional and comparative anatomy, being com comparing detailed comparisons between organisms, looking at their similarities and differences. Uh, there's a portrait of Cuvier. Um, and one of the critical things he did, from our perspective, from Earth history, is that he was the first person to reconstruct fossil vertebrates. These bones have been found for, you know, ages. People have been collecting bones and attributing them to, to you know, dragons and, and cyclopses and all kinds of things and mystical beings. Um, and he was the first one to start taking these bones because of his understanding of anatomy, his experience in seeing a vast range of, of living organisms, um, to be able to see how those bones could be assembled and put together. Um, uh, so he had this idea of correlation of parts, which meant that every bone in your anatomy, every bone in an organism is uh, connected to another bone in a very specific way. So you can start with one bone and you kind of predict what the next bone is going to be like. Um, and so what he was able to do is take these bones, you do, normally don't find, uh, extremely rare to find fossil vertebrates all kind of, you know, laid out like, you know, it was in Jurassic Park, you know, where they take the little broom and, you know, it's a perfect velociraptor. It, that doesn't happen. You only know, just have scattered bones, right? And so, he was able to take those and assemble them and reconstruct the past in a very visceral, visual kind of way. And the first thing he did was reassemble these organisms from what we would call the Pleistocene today, what they called the surficial gravels. So one thing that he did was compare them to what he knew. 
So what we have here is, at the top, is a jaw from a mammoth, and at the bottom is an Indian elephant. So we made two conclusions. One is, the thing at the top, that fossil jaw, is a fossil elephant, but it's not a living fossil elephant. It doesn't look like any of the living elephants. So this is raising this question of extinction. In fact, he was able to then reconstruct whole organisms. This is reconstruction of a mastodon. And what he realized is that these was an extinct fauna, a whole group of extinct organisms that no longer live. And it was pretty hard to argue that these things were still wandering the world someplace that hadn't been discovered. And so he was the person who finally convinced people that extinction was real, that really was a past, a living past of organisms that are no longer living. So the past was different than the present, that life had changed. These are, uh, the top two are skulls of um, living sloths. The bottom one is the skull of a ground sloth, which are huge things. Um, and he recognized it was a sloth again, but that it was not like anything living. So again, an extinct fauna here is the whole skeleton of the ground sloth. Giant armadillos called glyptodonts. A whole fauna, deer, woolly rhinos, all kinds of things. So then, again, everyone understood Steno's principles is the further you go down, the farther you're going back in time. So we started looking at rocks that were older, that is underneath the sur surficial gravels, and older and older rocks going down. So we know we're going back in time because we're going down in the rocks. And what he found was, each time he went to older and older rocks and started reconstructing the organisms, they were different. And the further he went back in time, they got increasingly different from things that are living today. <clears throat> so in 1801, he uh, made this statement, the older the beds in which these bones are found, the more they differ from those we know of animals we know today. The further you go back, the weirder things get. Okay. So these were now rock layers older than those surficial gravels, what we call the tertiary today. Uh, and it's recognizing mammals, but they didn't easily fit into modern groups. You'd say, well, it's a, <coughs> a, um, um, you know, a parasodactyl and artiodactyl, so you know, a, a single hoofed, single to, uh, odd toed uh, herbivore, or an even toed herbivore, but they didn't fit into modern categories. They were kind of amalgams or, or um, um, had shared features of different groups today in a single animal. Um, so here's one of those called Paleotherium, which just means ancient beast, really original name. Um, but again, these, these were, you know, the, you tell, you know, it was a hoofed herbivore, but it didn't fit into any matter, uh, modern categories. Same thing with uh, the carnivores. Um, and then you go back even further into what was called the Cretaceous chalks, which are yet older. And now things got really weird, okay? Didn't find any mammals at all. Everything was dominated by reptiles, really strange reptiles. Uh, the chalks were marine units, so these are marine reptiles. Things like mosasaurs, there's a, it really captures the excitement that existed at this time. And this, Imagine, um, you know, wake up tomorrow and the, newspaper, the headline in the newspaper reads, you know, undeniable dragon skeleton found in China. How that would hit the press, right? Wow, you know, we thought they were, you know. But that's the kind of thing that was happening here. These were bizarre, completely amazing animals that had no parallel on Earth today, and they were real, right? So things like mosasaurs, these giant marine lizards. Uh, there is the illustration by Cuvier of, of one of these uh, mosasaurs. Ichthyosaurs, again, another kind of uh, swimming reptile, kind of looks superficially like um, a dolphin, but it's completely unrelated. It's a reptile. Um, 
Again, other kind of bizarre uh, swimming reptiles, flying reptiles, pterodactyls. Um, so this, another whole community, a whole uh, ecosystem of extinct organisms. So we start out with Steno. Steno gave us Earth history. Steno gave us a timeline. It's a timeline without dates. It's just saying this happened, this happened, and this happened, and this happened. So we have a timeline, and we can put events on that timeline. It doesn't, there's no dates. It's just a relative timeline. Now on that relati relative timeline, we can put the fossil record. So we can say these animals lived, then these animals lived, then these animals lived, then these animals lived, and there is a directional history. So not only is a directional history to the, the physical Earth, but there's a directional history to life on Earth. Cuvier, remember when he lived? What he saw is these successive communities of, of extinct organisms. And his, his response was that these were revolutions in Earth history. That's what his whole life was. You know, French Revolution, you know, Napoleon. I mean, his life was nothing but revolutions. So it also shows how the culture of the time, the politics, that science, like everything, is cited in a particular time and a particular place. And it's influenced by that culture. Um, and so he used this concept of revolutions to understand Earth history. And so he saw a whole sequence of these revolutions in which past life was swept away and replaced by a different group of organisms. And he saw the last one of those revolutions as being Noah's flood. Um, but Cuvier never addressed the question of where the new species came from. Some, he, didn't, he didn't address that question. What that did, what that uh, understanding of the history of life uh, did, was now provide a way to um, link things together, what we call correlate from one place to another. Because what they found was that regardless of where he goes, there's now that everyone is starting to look at the fossil record and see how different fossils appear in the geologic record according to their position, right? And what they found was, regardless of where you went on the Earth, those different communities of organisms always appeared in the same order. They were never mixed up. They were never out of order. They were always in the same sequence. And therefore, if you set, find this set of fossil organisms, you knew you were in the same time period. That was the basis of creation of the geologic time scale. So all the periods, the geologic periods, uh, were defined and still are defined on the basis of their fossil content. Okay? Now, one thing that is often very commonly misunderstood about this is this had absolutely nothing to do with evolutionary theory, which had not yet been accepted. That was a later understanding. And that this system of correlation of putting together the geologic time scale would work even if fossils weren't the remains of once living organisms. In fact, the person who made the first geologic maps used them as though they might as well have been, you know, screws and bolts and nails and washers that you know, the layer of washers always came before the layer of bolts everywhere you go, so I'm going to map the layer of washers. I'm going to make a map to show where the layer of washers is, I'm going to make a map showing where the layer of bolts are. That's exactly how they used it. And it was used for entirely practical purposes, like where to find mineable ores, where to find coal, where to find building stone. Okay? So the fossils were used uh, just as markers in order to find your place. Um, and so by uh, 1814, or uh, excuse me, about uh, 1840s and the latter half of the 1800s, 
the, geolo the modern geologic time scale was worked out. It was worked out within decades of Cuvier's work. Uh, and what's important is that the people who did that were Christians um, and were doing it in completely within their um, theological worldview. Um, so uh, this is kind of repeating what I already said. Um, this is one of the first maps, or the first map of Britain that was done on that basis. Also starting to make cross sections. None of this was possible before this ability to use fossils to, to recognize where you were. Two of the most important people in the development of the geologic time scale was Roderick Murchison uh, and Adam Sedgwick. Um, Sedgwick was um, actually the, um, um, I think he was the dean of Christ Church, I'm not sure. Uh, but he's a theologian as well as a geologist, as most of these people were. They had theological training as well as scientific training. Uh, and here's a quote uh, of Sedgwick's to show his perspective about what he was doing as a geologist, this new, brand new, exciting science of geology. He says, no opinion can be a heretical, but that which is not true. Conflicting falsehoods we can comprehend, but truths can never war against each other. I affirm, therefore, that we have nothing to fear from the results of our inquiries, provided they be followed in the laborious but secure road of honest induction. In this way, we may rest assured that we shall never arrive at conclusions opposed to any truth, either physical or moral, from whatever source that truth may be derived. Okay? So that he, there was no sense of conflict in his mind about pursuing the understanding of the earth history and his theology. Because all truth is God's truth, and truth cannot war against truth. Um, William Buckland came in uh, subsequent to that. And Buckland is kind of significant because he was one of the, the last um, geologists of the 1800s uh, that uh, was still um, arguing for uh, an important role of um, uh, Noah's flood in, uh, in the geologic record. And like Cuvier, he and Cuvier had similar views on this, is that these surficial gravels were produced by um, the Noachian flood. And it was th sometimes it's called diluvium. Um, and the short story, make, uh, long story short, is that uh, as he continued to, to pursue his study, look at the fossil record, um, from this time period, he began to understand that these fossil deposits that he was looking at were not deposited by a flood, uh, that, that they had other, were accumulated in other uh, ways. For example, he looked at a lot of cave deposits, which he originally thought were the flood waters rushing into caves and carrying the bones of animals into the, into the caves. And later, by looking at a very, very detailed study of these bones, he recognized that these were hyena dens, uh, and that the hyenas were bringing their prey into the dens, and that these showed the evidence of being gnawed and carried and manipulated by hyenas. So they weren't washed in by, by water. And there's a cartoon of the time related to that, his uh, work there. And then within his lifetime, um, uh, other work uh, by other geologists recognized that these surficial gravels, these superficial gravels, were actually deposited by ice, by comparing, by again, this actualism, by going, looking at ice deposit sediments along the edges of, of glaciers, uh, and recognizing that the sediments they were looking at were actually formed by what we now call the Pleistocene Ice Age, uh, and that they were deposited by uh, melting ice. And so the flood no longer was seen as having a geologic record. That doesn't mean that people dismissed the uh, existence of a flood, but that it did not leave uh, a record, it did not leave a geologic record. Um, so what was the response of theologians to this? <clears throat> um, well, um, as we've uh, already seen, 
there are lots of uh, ways of understanding um, scripture, understanding the, the opening chapters of Genesis. And these are already in existence, and some were, uh, were, um, um, were, were understood uh, to, to be compatible with the new science of geology and other things that were being found. Two of the most common interpretations at this time, the late 1800s, uh, was the uh, day-age theory and the gap theory, which is also called the ruin restoration model. Uh, these were very popularly held, very commonly held at this time, uh, in which the, the days of Genesis were periods of time, or that uh, all of Earth history can be compressed between the first uh, verse of Genesis and the second verse of Genesis. And that was called the gap theory, that you could fit all of Earth history into that, that that world, that ancient world was destroyed and then recreated beginning in verse 2. Um, these two views still exist to get today. They're still promoted by uh, some people today, but have been superseded in a lot of ways by a lot of uh, uh, new interpretations and understandings of, of Genesis, as we've seen with, with uh, John Walton's presentation. Um, the conclusion of this is that by the end of the 1800s, um, there were virtually no Christian scientists or theologians who argued for a young, recently created Earth. Virtually non-existent. Um, and that uh, evangelical theologians, including those that strenuously argued uh, for biblical inerrancy and divine inspiration of scripture, had absolutely no trouble with an ancient Earth. It was a non-issue. In fact, Many of the, well, as far as I know, all of the authors of the a group of publications called The Fundamentals um, that um, was written um, towards the end of the 1800s um, had no problem with an ancient earth. A number of the people who were writing for the fundamentals, and this is, the fundamentals were basically a reaction against uh, modern biblical and literary criticism, which was uh, rising at that point in significance and influence. And so this was a, a theological response to critiques of the historicity of scripture, of biblical inerrancy, of, of miracles, of the divinity of Christ, of the resurrection. These things were all uh, coming to a head, and there was, there was um, these movements that were threatening those um, understandings of scripture. And so the evangelical uh, reformed theologians at the time got together and put together this series of volumes called The Fundamentals. B.B. Warfield was one of them. Uh, he was in Princeton Theological Seminary. He's a very strong advocate uh, for the Bible as the inspired and inerrant word of God. Inerrancy was one of his main uh, emphasis, emphases. Uh, James Orr, uh, he was uh, from Glasgow, um, Scottish Presbyterian. Uh, both of these uh, individuals, as well as a number of others, made important contributions to the fundamentals. Uh, this is a statement by uh, James Orr. When I am asked, as I sometimes am, which of these articles of evangelical faith I am prepared to part with, at the insistence of modern thought and in the interest of reconstructed theology, I answer with fullest confidence, none of them. Okay? So these were very, uh, very conservative, evangelical people who were convinced of uh, the inspiration of scripture and, in fact, biblical inerrancy, and yet none of them had trouble with an ancient earth. It was a non-issue. So, how much time do I have here? Um, oh, yeah, okay. Uh, so, what, what I want to end with here is um, um, how do we get from there to here? Um, one of those is that uh, among the other events that happened at the end of the 1800s was uh, the rise of this warfare view of science and faith which was largely stimulated by the writings of these two authors, William Draper and Andrew Dickinson White. Who, these were polemical writings that were written as a history, 
but they were polemical, and many of the science warfare kind of myths or stories that you hear had their origin there with those authors and some others. Um, and this has been studied extensively by modern historians, and their work has been recognized as highly biased. Some of their work has been out, was outright fabricated. Uh, stories that they wrote uh, as, as history were fabrications. Um, and yet those myths continue and continue to bolster and support this idea that science and faith were always in this perpetual warfare with each other. Um, so, uh, again, this is the fundamentals. And um, what I want to end with here is um, this idea of continuous creation. I think John Walton uh, uh, alluded to it. And it was a, a foundational approach that most of these theologians made and, and evangelical theologians to this day, which is that God is active everywhere, all the time, and all that happens. Okay? God is continuously, creatively active. That creation isn't something that is an interruption. That, that God does not intervene in the history, either in, in, in natural history or human history, in the sense of God was stepping outside and then kind of shows up and does something and then steps out again, right? God is always there. You can't intervene if you're already there, okay? So really what, what a, a view of, of God is only active in, in these interventions is you basically end up with episodic deism. You know, most of the time, God is tuned out, uninvolved, out there someplace, and every now and then he jumps in to kind of fix things. And then he hops back out and lets things run. Continuous creation says God's there intimately, actively, all the time in human history and natural history. God is the ground upon which reality exists. I mean, some people say if, if God with, to, would withdraw his presence from the natural world, the natural world would simply cease to exist. It's, up, and it's upheld in its very existence by God's activity. And so if you approach the natural world from that perspective, it's not like you're going to some area in which God isn't present. God is actively present, excitingly, wondrously present in everything that's happening. Um, and um, so that that, that transforms your, your approach to understanding the natural world is you're kind of thinking God's thoughts after him. And, and, and um, again, truth can't war against truth. So I'll end there. Uh, thank you very much. That was <clears throat> exceedingly rich. Um, let's invite uh, John Walton back up. And I think... Um, We'll give you gentlemen the chairs. There's two up here. And may, maybe I'll just uh, stand off the stage. Uh, and then we have one mic, one mic here to go around. Do you want to take this we have, one? We have this and Robin can take the other one and then you can take the corded mic. Okay, perfect. And then she can take that and we'll cover both sides. Okay. And we're going to, uh, same uh, program where we'll uh, uh, take hands and uh, take questions, and so I see some already. That's wonderful. And uh, we have a good 35 uh, minutes uh, for question and answer. This one's going to be on. This one's on? Good. Excellent. Thank you, sound booth. Uh, let me maybe just <coughs> kick off uh, with a question of my own. Um, so I, I was struck in listening to both of the talks uh, that the way that you described your methodology and, and your science was at least analogous to the way that you described sort of your science, if you're comfortable calling that, of, <laughs> of biblical interpretation. Uh, and so, in a sense, you're both doing a science. And, and I wanted to, I guess, ask if, if you're comfortable with that. And then maybe to hear from John, if uh, you might reflect on how your faith 
informs your science. Uh, and I know that's a, you know, I'm asking that to the biblical scholar, right? Um, so, yeah. Oh, and you don't have a light. You're going to put that. Okay. Um, you know, when I teach hermeneutics, the principles of interpretation to my classes, one of the things that I bring out is that we are, we are actually working on some of the same principles that work for the sciences. Uh, we depend on external verification. We are looking for peer review. Uh, and that's, that's just saying that when I present an interpretation of a passage, um, I'm presenting evidence uh, that will substantiate it, as you heard me do this morning. Uh, and that's the same thing that a scientist will do, develop evidence in, other, in order to substantiate a hypothesis. Uh, that it's evidence that should be repeatable. Somebody else should be able to look at my data and come to the same conclusions. And that it's subject to peer review. That is, other people are going to try to replicate it and, and do the same kind of thing. So in that sense, the principles uh, have some similarity to them. Uh, I also make a point, though, to say that um, we don't we don't restrict ourselves in this way because the Bible is restricted in how it can, can communicate. Uh, hermeneutics is not there to constrain the Bible, to kind of make it conform to certain expectations that we have. Hermeneutics is there to constrain us so that we don't do wild and crazy things, which we have a history of doing. And so the idea that we have to constrain ourselves so that we have a basis for saying, here's an interpretation, and this is what the Bible is saying, not just kind of something that, that I'm making up. So in that sense, this connects to my faith because this is the way that I show my respect for the biblical text. The biblical text should be able to stand with its message apart from me. Now, granted, we all have to, I mean, interpretation is how we figure it out. But I'm trying to figure out what the Bible says that is not just me. I don't want it thinking my thoughts after me. I want to think its thoughts after, after it. So in that sense, that's how my faith comes into that. I don't know if that's what you're shooting for in that or, or not, but that's, that's kind of how I would think about that. Yeah. Uh, from a somewhat different angle, one thing that I see as critical in science is its historical context. Uh, there is no such thing as objective science. Because we, there's no such thing as approaching a problem or a question or an observation with a blank mind. That this, this doesn't happen, right? You, you come with who you are. You come with your cultural context. You come with what you already know or think you know. Um, and and that, that helps guide what you see and don't see. Um, and science and theology, I might say, are not static things. Um, the truth is, I mean, the, there, there is an objective truth out there. I think there's an objective reality of what God intended to speak through scripture, and there's an objective reality of what the earth history was. There is that objective reality out there, and that's what we're all striving for, to understand. But we're never going to be there entirely. Uh, and so it's, it's always a, a changing thing. And that's cool. That's what science is. If it was static, <clears throat> it would be doctrine or it'd be, you know, an, it'd be inflexible, unchanging uh, doctrine, which you're locking in error. <laughs> you know, you can't correct something if it's, if it's not capable of being changed. So the, the cool thing about science is it's dynamic, it's changing. It changes as we get new information. It changes our understandings, change as we gather new tools to be able to see types of things we couldn't see before. And that's one kind of thing I was trying to point out in this brief history is each of those steps opened up new avenues of vision that just didn't exist before. Because those ideas weren't even on the table before. And once they're on the table, then it transforms how people understand it. Um, both of your presentations uh, challenged and uh, sort of surprised some of us, but that's mostly because we're coming from a place where this seems like material that's counter what we've learned growing up, and that's really helpful now, especially when I looked at the resource table. They're definitely written for uh, people coming from a modern experience, and how do we relook, especially at ancient Near East cultures, things like that. H how would you 
either of you recommend we go about teaching this to the next generation? At what age do we say, boy, the, the things that you're seeing in your children's Bibles are a little too simplistic. We really need to bring in that this is the story of home rather than house, or well, let's look at the geological record. I mean, how, how could we bring that into Christian education or youth groups, things like that, so that we wouldn't have to be later correcting our mistakes from oversimplifying it for modern Americans? I think it, uh, these things should be discussed at, at the earliest levels, but like anything, you have to figure out what's age appropriate. When I talk to young children about creation, I don't try to tell them what Genesis 1 isn't. I try to give them a strong idea of what it is. And so I'll talk more, even if I don't use the language of home story, I'll talk more about that, how God made this place work and how God put it all together for us and he did it for a reason. And so I'll emphasize the, the theological issues um, and in that way strive to not put in place the material default uh, that we often think of. Once we get into youth groups, uh, you know, beyond kind of children into youth groups, I think that we, uh, we certainly need to address these things with our youth uh, from middle school and high school on so that they are well equipped to think through them. Uh, my fear is, and I don't have statistics, but my fear is that too many churches either avoid it altogether because they just don't know how to do it. Most youth pastors aren't trained as scientists. Um, uh, or that they take a very dogmatic, um, almost reactionary view toward it uh, that, that really ends up being much to the disadvantage of the young people. Um, so, uh, you know, I've, uh, as I've tried to write these lost world books, I've tried to write them in ways that are going to be understandable for a high school reader, for a youth pastor, um, so that they can work at trying to present those things. And I know that there are curricula also being prepared for homeschoolers and uh, high schoolers and things of that sort to make this viewpoint available there. I think from a, a scientific perspective, I think one of the most critical thing, two things are to instill a, a confident curiosity in kids. Um, growing up, uh, my parents probably overindulged my curiosities. But I never grew up with sensing that something was off limits. Like, don't think about that. Don't, you know, don't go there. You know, that, that you go there and you're, you're out, you're, you know, you're pushing the boundaries. I never had that. Um, and so, um, and to me, if, if we really deep down, if we really confidently assured in our faith, uh, and in uh, the reality of, of a God who, who took the cost of becoming human, becoming one of us, living out an exemplary life, dying and resurrecting on our behalf, um, that that God isn't going to let us down. He's a God of truth. He's a creator God. He's not just the redeemer. He's a creator. The creator is the redeemer. That there shouldn't be fear. And I think too often we operate out of a realm of fear and we, and then kids pick up on that. Um, why should you be afraid of the truth? The truth should never be a problem, right? If we really believe what we believe, truth is not a threat. Tr truth is exciting wherever that goes. And if that ends up maybe changing a perspective that we have, that's good because we're all wrong. I, one, one absolute certainty that I have is I'm absolutely certain I'm wrong about stuff, okay? And if, and I've got to, you have to be willing to say, yeah, I am wrong. I know, I don't, troubles, I don't know where necessarily I'm wrong, but I've got to be wrong. And so if, if we don't allow ourselves to unabashedly and excitedly pursue truth, we're not going to find those correctives. I thought it was very important as my kids were growing up to teach them to be critical thinkers yeah. and to assure them that that didn't mean they had to come to the same conclusions I did. Um, and that idea that we're not, we're not there to pass on the answers for everybody for all time, we're there to help them to learn how to think. 
And there, there's nobody that gives me stronger um, pushback and arguments than my kids. They, they're very capable of that. By the way, have you noticed that we grew up about 20 miles from each other? We both say water. <laughs> Um, thank you very much for speaking for us. Um, my question is mostly for Dr. Miller, um, but um, let's see. It's, um, I'm sure a lot of us have heard about the group Answers in Genesis and about the work that they're doing um, to promote a, um, a young earth creation story. Um, and Thinking about this and having heard um, the debate between Bill Nye and Ken Ham, um, Ken Ham brings up historical science and observational science as two different forms of thinking about science. Um, and this was a new concept to me, and I'm just wondering if you have any comment on that and um, how how you think um, if you if you think in these terms or mm -hmm. not. Uh, I would argue that that is a very false dichotomy. Um, in a sense, all science is historical. Um, let's say you're a chemist, right? Um, and I have you know, two vials of chemicals, and I mix them together. It's a laboratory experiment, right? Kind of a thing with quintessential science, right? White lab coats and stuff. So, you know, you're doing a chemical experiment, <clears throat> and uh, so you have this new solution, right? Did you observe that? There's no way to directly observe what happened. What do you do? You go and you analyze that sample after the reaction's already happened, right? You analyze what components are in that test tube, you know what components were in the initial test tube, and you reconstruct what happened in between. You never saw it. You never can see it. It's completely, it's historical. So it happened an hour ago. It's still historical. You're not observing it in real time. So regardless of what you do, astronomy, right, light takes time to travel. You're looking at events that happened in the past. So in a sense, you know, whether it was last second or five billion, you know, four and a half billion years ago, you're looking at an event that happened in the past, and you're reconstructing what happened. There's no other choice. So I would say that that, that is a false dichotomy. Uh, it's just kind of a matter of degree in the kind of things that you're, the kind of events that you're trying to reconstruct. But you're always reconstructing things that you're not, in, 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 uh, in the natural world, that you're not directly observing. I mean, that's what you're trying to get at, is really what you can't see directly. debate of the carbon dating, because it's very confusing to a lot of us who are not in this field, and a lot of the youth, when they hear really strong opinion from Christians on both sides, and um, at the end you get lost. So can you just give us some, you know, opinion about it? Okay, I, um, I'm, um, um, radiometric dating is, is not my field, but the first important thing is to realize that carbon dating is pretty much irrelevant to that whole discussion. Uh, there is a whole range of different radiometric tools uh, that are used to date. There are also non-radiometric ways of dating, too. Um, and each of the methodologies is only valid for certain time intervals. Uh, and carbon dating is only good to a couple uh, tens of thousands of years ago. After that, carbon dating is useless. Uh, plus, it only can date something that was once living. It's carbon dating, so you have to d d uh, date organic matter. Uh, and so what it's used for is reconstructing uh, history of the Pleistocene, archaeological work. I mean, if carbon dating didn't work, almost all biblical archaeology would be, I mean, that's the basis of dating archaeological artifacts, one of them. Uh, so you, you know, date a timber that's in an archaeological site or a fire, you know, a coal in a fireplace and 
date what time that fire was, you know, that's all carbon dating. So carbon dating is really used for recent history that overlaps with, you know, historical human history. Uh, and a little farther back. Um, but there are all these other techniques that are used for greater and greater time periods. Um, and um, the simplest way of uh, just the basics of, of carbon dating is you have uh, a radiometric element that spontaneously uh, um, uh, fissions to create another set of daughter elements. And it does so um, um, at, at a constant rate, and we can verify that. We can experimentally demonstrate that that, that rate is constant. And so, um, let's say you had a box that was just filled with, with red balls, and, and, uh, and I gave that to you, and I sent you out of the room, and I said, you know, every five minutes, take a red ball out and put a blue ball in. Okay, or take, you know, actually half, to, to half the red ones out and, and, and put blue ones in. So go out and start that whenever you want. Don't tell me, just start whenever you want. And then I'll call you in the room and I'll tell you precisely when you started to, to exchange the balls. That's what radiometric does. Okay, so you measure those two, that ratio, and that gives you the lapse time. Uh, that's the, the very basics of it. But the point is, there's a whole lot of techniques that are used. Uh, they're very precise. They only work under certain circumstances. They only work with certain kind of minerals. Uh, and there's a whole, um, you can't just go and randomly date something. It doesn't work. They only, it only works in, for particular um, materials in particular circumstances that you're able to do that. Very, very quickly, I should say, for me, radiometric dating is not that big an issue uh, as, as far as communicating this because the scientific community had long been convinced of a very ancient Earth before radiometric dating was even possible. There was no absolute dating available. It was all relative dating. But just looking at the geologic record of the events that occurred in the order in which they happened, you have to say the Earth is very ancient. You just can't say how ancient. And that's what radiometric dating allows you to do. But tell us, an old Earth is not dependent on radiometric dating. It was recognized and accepted long before radiometric dating existed. So we, we talk about uh, God creating and God ordering, and I hear talk at times of a transcendent God or an eminent God. I'm wondering, for, from two people who think a lot about God, how, how, do, you, how do you actually think about God? <laughs> <laughs> all the time um, I mean my theology is, is a very traditional theology um, all the things that you would read in basic <laughs> basic yeah it sounds like a Geiger counter I'm just <laughs> saying <laughs> you know, all the basics of, of theology about the nature of Christ and the nature of, uh, of the Holy Spirit and the nature of the Bible are all the same kinds of things that the church has always believed. Uh, so I think about God in those kinds of ways, God of grace, God of power. Uh, yeah, I don't know that there's any differences. And this doesn't, proper interpretation of scripture will always, I think, uh, enhance your view of God because it gives you a, uh, a better view of how God reveals himself in scripture. I don't know what more to say about that. No, I guess all I would add is with regard to the transcendent versus imminent, um, that uh, God is both. God is um, uh, other than his creation, which is important. That the creation is other than, than God. Um, and and that, I think that, that's very fundamental. Uh, and at the same time, God is intimately, inextricably connected to the physical world. Um, and I think maybe in this debate, that's part of, of what's lost, is, is that we, we're really big on the transcendence, but maybe we don't emphasize the imminence of God enough. Imminence in just 
day to day, you know, I'm talking, you know, creation, my creation in my mother's womb, kind of, I mean, realized that God was present there and creatively active in my, very, in my life, in my history, and my Christian walk. God is imminently active in that. I think that sometimes we, we lose that. And I agree with that. That doesn't, so on that issue of transcendence and imminence, um, I would say exactly all of those things. That doesn't lead us to say, oh, me and Jesus are going to the supermarket and he's going to tell me what, we're, what I'm going to buy, you know, or what are we going to have for dinner, you know. Not that, but in terms of the, the way the world operates, you know, very much trying to move away from the deistic ideas that have God kind of on the outside and uninvolved in so much of what goes on. Um, so, yeah. Uh, this question is for Dr. Miller. Um, Walt Brown, in his book, In the Beginning, I'm not sure if you've read that or not, he talked about a process called liquefaction, where the, um, the waves of the water in the, in the flood would have gone over the earth, and that would have caused the, the um, sediment particles to form all the layers that we see today. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? Um, just to, to put it bluntly, <laughs> there is no geologic evidence for a global flood. Uh, and uh, I can go to any, virtually any outcrop, any exposure of rock, and uh, recognize features in that that um, could not possibly have occurred in that kind of a setting. Um, one, my, a lot of my research in, in Kansas uh, is involved what are called cyclophems, uh, which dominate the geology of that part of Kansas. And what they are is they're alternations between terrestrial and marine units over and over again. And uh, so shallow seas, uh, succeeded by terrestrial environments, which are represented by fossil soil horizons. Uh, and those fossil uh, soil horizons have the same geological, chemical, structural features as modern soils do. In fact, what I do in my research is reconstruct ancient climate from those ancient soils. There's different types of soils form in different kind of environments. And you can recognize all these different soil types in the geologic record, in the rock record, and then infer the kind of climate that existed when those soils were forming. And this is also this period of Earth history, ancient Earth history, in which there was an ice age. And the reason you get these alternations is because the glaciers were advancing and retreating. Every time the glaciers advanced, the water that was in the oceans came down as snow, compacted into glacial ice, sea levels fell. When the glaciers melted back, that water ran back into the oceans and the sea level went back up again. So the global sea levels were bouncing up and down. And where I live now in Kansas, that area was periodically inundated. Every time the ice melted, it was flooded. Every time the glaciers advanced, the seas pulled away. And so you get these repetitions dozens and dozens and dozens of times. Okay? So I can just, I mean, just by pointing, I can go one off and say, that's a paleosol. A paleosol cannot form from a flood, period. Uh, and those outcrops, every single outcrop in Kansas has a paleosol in it. So, uh, so th there isn't, there, there just is, that's, that's why it was abandoned. By the 1800s, it was completely abandoned uh, with, without hesitation. I mean, no, none of the authors of the fundamentals had any trouble with an ancient earth. It was a done issue by then. Uh, Dr. Walton, I, in listening, you know, uh, this morning, uh, I only the only question I have, and I and, and I'm, I'm truly just looking for, um, with Adam and Eve, um, through them was created the separation between God and man. So where does that fit in? I mean, am I, I mean, uh, the serpent? And then you had the serpent deceiving Eve, and then Adam was kind of going along with Eve. And uh, how does that? How does that? Again, I associate those um, 
those transactions with the historical Adam and Eve. Like I said, I have no trouble with that, that these were individuals, and that took place kind of on their watch when, when they were there. Um, so uh, what time period that was, what date we would, my, we have no way of knowing, because the Bible doesn't tell us, and science can't track them as individuals. All right. Um, first, I, Dr. Walton, I just get really uh, jacked when I hear talk about God's rest and just his rest and rule, and it gets me pumped in thinking about it, um, and just the cosmic temple. And, whew, but I have a Chills. question, I have a, and, and, and I, I'm not quite sure what to do with this, but I was thinking about um, the concept of Sabbath rest and God's rest and Israelite rest and um, how th th that was kind of one of the rationales for them taking a day off was because God rested on the seventh, but God's rest looks different. And so I was just wondering if you could talk about the interaction of those two types yeah. of rest. Yeah, I long ago took that out of the presentation because somebody always asks, and that way I get extra time. Um, so yes, thank you for asking. <laughs> thank you for asking that. Um, obviously, uh, if, if we're going to try to uh, if we're per persuaded of this view of the Sabbath in day seven, then that's going to bring an adjustment to how we think about observing the Sabbath. The mistake we make is that we think that when we observe Sabbath that we are to be imitating God. Well, in this interpretation, that doesn't work very well because we're not going to imitate God by ruling as much as we would like to. And, well, yeah, that was the fall. So, um, so what does it mean when we are working the six days and not to work the seventh days, okay, then, then what's that all about? Well, if God's creation, his work was ordering the world so that it works for us, when we work our six days, we are trying to order our worlds to work for us, put food on the table, you know, uh, take care of our families, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We are working to try to bring order to our world. And it'd be easy to think that that's all on us. That that's what we do. We've made our own way. I did it my way. You know, that kind of thing. Sabbath observance is not us imitating God by ruling. Sabbath observance is us participating in God's rule. Meaning that for one day we say, it's not on me. I'm not the one who brings order to my world. God's the one who brings order to my world. I'm not the one ruling. He's the one ruling. So I'm going to set aside my order-bringing activities to recognize him as the ultimate order-bringer and participate in his order, in his kingdom, in his rule. And that's how we observe Sabbath. Um, this is directed to Dr. Walton. Um, in summary, in a sentence, what I heard you say was um, the, the creation account in Genesis 1 um, describes the functional origins. And so I have two questions. First one is you're looking at it biblically as a, the text itself. Mm -hmm. Do you point to any biblical text that, that does address the material origins? So that's question one. And um, the second question, uh, I don't want to drive you out of here or ask for three more seminars or something, but it seems like it was a bit of a bombshell to mainstream Christian thinking um, to not think of Genesis 1 speaking to that. Um, so my question, the second question would be, do you have a top five, top three, maybe just one other bombshell that might be that you've seen? <laughs> from looking at uh, the text uh, as an Old Testament scholar? Uh, that's how I make my living. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, um, so first of all, in the rest of the Bible, well, sure. Yeah, I mean, the, it's, it's addressed very rarely, but you know, when, when the Bible says, even in a psalm, about God laying the foundations of the earth, well, I think that's, that's more material in nature, but they don't tell you anything about it, when or how or what process is or anything, just God did it. Uh, that's an Old Testament context, and that's about all you get in an Old Testament context. In a New Testament context, you know, Christ uh, as the creator of all things visible and invisible, you know, that, that includes the material. 
uh, John 1. I mean, there are places you can go to where it will address the material issues. Again, not, not very much, uh, just in passing, but enough for us to affirm that as theologically sound. Other bombshells, well, yeah. Um, Sure, there's always, there's always more every course, every day. Every, you know, this is what I do. But, um, uh, of course, they, I, after Lost World of Adam and Eve came out about six weeks ago, people started asking, okay, what's the next Lost World book? And I basically said, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not really planning on doing any more. I got a GPS, and there's not Lost Worlds anymore. <laughs> and, uh, or <laughs> if there are Lost Worlds, I, I haven't found them, so I don't know what to do. And uh, especially people said, you're going to do a lost world of the flood. And I said, no, you know, again, uh, I suspect there are lost world issues connected to the flood, but uh, I, I don't have any great insights to contribute, you know, to do a book on that. Well, uh, over the last six weeks, conversation has continued, and yes, now I am going to be doing a Lost World of the Flood book. So that's, that's coming, yeah. I don't know, you might not clap after you read it. But... Um, <laughs> But uh, again, we've, we've identified a number of things that can really help us to read the flood account. Um, and so, uh, but it will also include um, from Genesis 4 all the way up to the Tower of Babel. And the Tower of Babel is, uh, I did my dissertation on the Tower of Babel, and there's, there's a lot of lost world stuff going on there. Uh, ziggurats are built not for people to go up, but for God to come down. And that makes a big difference in that account. I bear not, I could go on for a long time. Nephilim will be there. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was this mic that was going bad, so I turned it off for a while. I'm curious on uh, both of your perspectives from a text scientist and a paleontologist, uh, how you view the very detailed description of uh, the behemoth in Job. Well, I just wrote a commentary on Job, and I've got a, a shorter book called How to Read Job coming out in a couple months. Um, so I had to deal with Behemoth and Leviathan, and uh, I think it's pretty clear that they are chaos creatures. Uh, chaos creatures are not zoological categories. Um, they are creatures connected with non-ordered world, um, and the, uh, it's not so important what they are as it is what the author, and in this case, particularly the speaker, God, do with them. Uh, just like uh, you know, Abraham or David or Esther, they, they are all characters in a story. They really existed, in my mind, uh, but still we can only get to them by how they are characterized in, in the narratives that are given to us. And it's the same with Behemoth and Leviathan. We can only... Uh, understand them as they have been characterized to us. Of course, lots of people try to connect them with uh, known zoological species or with dinosaurs, and Leviathan breathing fire and having multiple heads gets them every time. Mm -hmm. You know, that just doesn't match up with anything. So that's, uh, I don't know if you have anything to add. No, not really. So today we heard basically that uh, Common descent might be true, so let's uh, change the doctrine on that. Um, the old earth might be true, so let's make sure we interpret the Bible to accommodate that. Um, what else? If we have uh, the Exodus didn't really happen, the Torah wasn't written by Moses, but it was a, a compiled in the 7th century B.C., at, at what point do we say, I'm sure you wouldn't say, well, two parts. I'm sure you would say, no, that's mischaracterization. I'm interpreting the Bible as it should be, I've always interpreted. So what would you say to a skeptic who's saying, um, you, you're just moving the goalposts back? And secondly, um, what are the items that we shouldn't yield on? Uh, I'll just say a few things and you can jump in. Uh, my, <clears throat> my initial response to that is kind of going back to the statement I made earlier which is the idea of not fearing the truth. I will go wherever the truth goes. That's my bottom line. God is truth, I will go where the truth goes. Um, and we are imperfect beings, we don't know that truth in full, uh, and, we got, and we're all got it wrong. 
So we all have to be in the position of being willing to say, I don't know it, I don't have it right, and I'm willing to do the effort to try to get it better. Uh, and <clears throat> so I guess what I'm, part of it is we have to be willing to say, it's okay to be wrong. That is okay, because we're all wrong. If it's not okay to be wrong, we're in big trouble, okay? But the bedrock are the kinds of things we keep coming back to. I mean, my faith is not going to be damaged by um, uh, <clears throat> you know, new scientific discoveries or, or uh, you know, better understandings of, of the biblical, biblical literature or anything. If the, the, the fundamental bedrocks are the person and life and death and resurrection of Christ, those are, un, I mean, if, if, if somehow, it's some way that I can't imagine that those things are disproven, I would have to give up my faith. I wouldn't be a Christian anymore. It couldn't be. But I am, I am as confident about anything I am in the universe that those are truths. And so I can stand very confident, as confident on those as I can be on anything. Um, anyway, so that's why. It's certainly misleading to say that um, I changed the Bible to accommodate common descent or a young earth or an old earth. I didn't change the Bible. I'm trying to read the Bible, and I gave evidence for how I was reading it. So it's not a matter of changing the Bible. If in interpreting it, we suddenly find out that there's room for a certain kind of thinking, whatever it is, uh, then, well, that, that's fine. Then there's room for those. That's not changing the Bible, and it's certainly not in order to accommodate. I don't care if common descent's true or not. I don't know if it's true or not. People have their opinions on it. Okay, so this is not a matter of changing the text. What gave us the right to change the text to accommodate a modernist materialistic thinking after the Enlightenment? I mean, we shouldn't say that, well, that's obviously true just because it's been around for 300 years because of the Enlightenment. I mean, I'm suggesting that it was that it's the modernist materialist post-Enlightenment that was the alteration of the Bible to accommodate Enlightenment thinking. And if you go back to the ancient world, that it wasn't that at all. So I think it's a little bit, yeah, uh, that's, that's not what we were doing. Uh, what is sacrosanct? What the Bible teaches in its authority is sacrosanct. Now, but figuring out what it teaches in its authority is always a process of interpretation, and we do our best. Uh, but different people do come to different conclusions on certain things. Not on the deity of Christ, that's for sure, if you're taking the Bible seriously. So, sure, we, we draw, drive our stakes into the ground on the things that the Bible teaches. And we have to try to figure out what that is. Um, I, my belief in the Exodus would be because I'm firmly convinced from the evidence in the text that the Bible teaches there was an Exodus. Okay, the things that the Bible affirms are things that I affirm. That should always be the case. If we find out that something we thought the Bible affirmed and it doesn't affirm, well, then we need to start rethinking those particular issues. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> okay. There's, I've read books, and there's been cultures around the world that have um, supposedly stories of a flood. And so different cultures that we wouldn't, you know, that wouldn't be able to communicate together at whatever is what I've read. So my question is more with, towards you, Dr. Miller, mm -hmm. is um, with, with that said, and, the, and you, as I understand, you're really not for an actual Noah's, or a flood, correct? The I'll, geological? I'll, I'll elaborate okay, on okay. that. Anyways, how would you account for fossils of fish and so forth being on top of mountains in areas that they wouldn't be? Is that that horizontal thingy that you could <laughs> tell me about? <laughs> and then, you know, the continental um, rifts that are in the oceans and the, 
in the Atlantic and then the, you know what I'm, yes. where I'm going. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I don't have time to give you a whole geology course, but um, uh, with regard to your, your question about uh, flood stories, um, yeah, there are, there are uh, flood stories all over the world, and it's very reasonable that there are flood stories all around the world uh, because there have been floods all around the world. <laughs> Catastrophic floods. Floods of unimaginable, anything that were unimaginable on any recent historical scale. For example, there's the, the famous Scabland floods of, of uh, Oregon and Washington uh, that occurred uh, during the later stages of the last ice age in which there was catastrophic draining of some very large glacial lakes that poured across Oregon and Washington, scouring the ground, creating uh, canyons and huge waterfalls and enormous structures. And we can reconstruct that history. Um, there has also been catastrophic floods in South America. There have been catastrophic floods in Europe. There have been catastrophic floods in Asia. Almost any place you go, uh, in island nations, they have s giant tsunami histories. So it's pretty hard to be anywhere in the world where there isn't, uh, where there weren't gigantic, enormous flooding events that would be in the cultural memory of those various areas. Um, and that's, in, there's, that's entirely reasonable. We can find records of those kinds of floods. The, to follow up about uh, Noah's flood, uh, you know, one of the very real possibilities is Noah's flood was like one of those floods that happened in the ancient Near East. Uh, and we know that there were floods like that that happened there. And there's been a number of different scenarios that have been put forward as, as possible candidates. No one agrees on them. But the fact of, of huge catastrophic floods affecting you know, regions with, all around the world is a, is a, it's a you know, regular kind of geologic event that's ha happened around the world. So um, again, those stories are not at all su surprising and unexpected and you could very easily attribute the record of, of Noah's flood to one such event. Well, again, that's uh, going back, I mean, that's, that goes back to Stena, all the way back to the 1500s, uh, that, that there are a variety of different deformation processes that are occur occurring. Uh, that's what mountain building is all about. That's how you uplift mountains, right? Uh, and enormous compressive and extension, extensive uh, forces that, that thrust up mountains, uh, that um, uh, deform rocks and uplift rocks. Um, and the rates at which that happens geologically or that we can measure today are completely consistent with the geologic record. For example, with the rates at which the Himalaya mountains are currently rising because India is impaling Asia, we can measure how how fast that the Himalayan mountains are currently rising. If we go back in the geologic record to infer when the Himalayan mountains started to be uplifted, just about the right amount of time given their, their current rate of uplift to explain their current elevation. So it's entirely consistent with our known geology. Is it possible that there's been more floods on the No, it isn't. <laughs> it, 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 I, I guess part of it is, Geology is much more complex. Like I've tried to hint, you know, just in my backyard in Kansas, one outcrop may have a dozen different episodes of terrestrial exposure with vegetated landscapes and, and, and ancient soils, and just one outcrop. And there's thousands and thousands of feet of the geologic record, all of which have those kind of evidences of just about every conceivable environment that you can imagine that exists today exists in the geologic record. You can find examples of. Uh, and you, you can't create every possible environment and every possible circumstance by one event. It's just you can't do it. So you're left with uh, an event that, that certainly doesn't have a global record, um, but may have a local record if it's a, if it's a local event. All right. I'd like to say thank you to uh, Dr. Walton, Dr. Miller for being here. Let's give him a round of applause.